Hello everybody, Sunday TFCC discussion. <clears throat> Today, um, I'm going to give it a second to let everybody know I'm going live, but today I wanted to answer some questions um, that we're getting a lot on um, the Facebook group and on our website. Um, just want to remind everybody that um, my mission and the mission here at, at uh, Wrist Widget is to um, improve the understanding of TFCC tears. Um, uh, we spearhead a lot of research on on TF, the TFCC. We think that there's a long way to go on what we understand about the TFCC. <clears throat> and we know that there's a lot of confusion about what a TFCC tear is and how does it affect you and what to do about it. So today I just wanted to answer a couple of questions. It's going to be a brief Instagram Live. Hi, Sarah. Um, and the first is what to expect from a TFCC diagnosis. Um, so, uh, typically, somebody that has um, ulnar-sided wrist pain, and uh, usually it starts very small. Sometimes it can be after a fall, and it can be really painful, but uh, you go in to see your doctor, and the doctor runs a standard x-ray, three views, PA lateral and oblique, and they um, then uh, review those x-rays and put you in a wrist splint and have you come back six weeks later. If things don't improve, um, they might do a cortisone injection and then send you for an MRI. And the MRI, there's uh, a lot of variabilities in the position during the x-rays and the MRIs. And a radiologist will review that MRI and give a determination if there's something that comes up. MRIs are in general, and x-rays are in general, really poor tools to understand what's going on in the wrist. The wrist is really complicated. And the TFCC, the ulnar side of the wrist, is considered the black box of the, the human body. So there's a lot of things that can go on that um, get confused as TFCC tears. And so I kind of want to just go over that today. So <clears throat> when you have a, um, an MRI or an x-ray and you have a diagnosis of a TFCC, what do you expect? Again, typically you'll get a wrist splint and typically the wrist splint that you get compresses, pushes down on that ulna head and that, that's actually detrimental and um, painful and not helpful, oftentimes harmful. And um, so we have articulated a, a better way to identify, objectify a TFCC tear and that is that weight-bearing test. You need a non-digital scale, you place your hand flat, you keep your elbow straight, you put weight through your wrist, you stop when it hurts, and that's your, that's your starting point. And then you put a, uh, either a non-elastic tape on your wrist or the wrist widget, and what you should see is a change in your weight-bearing tolerance. If there is no change in your weight-bearing tolerance with the distal radius and the ulna squeeze together. The issue is not the TFCC, plain and simple. So if it does change and you get an improvement in your weight bearing tolerance, the next thing you need to know is it's how bad is it? Is it mild, moderate, or severe? What can I do now and what do I do with this information? So there are some landmarks that's taken a long time yeah, um, the, the MRIs are, especially with COVID and different healthcare infrastructures, they're expensive, they're highly prized, they're, they, they, there's too many people and not enough doctors and not enough MRI m machines, and then you have to get authorization from insurance companies. So the weight-bearing test is just a really cheap and easy way to understand the stability of your wrist and determine if the TFCC is involved. So when you do the weight-bearing test and your elbow straight, and you see a change, that tells you kind of where you're at. So normal weight bearing for the adult human wrist is between 70, 65, and 80 pounds. It's based on age, height, and bone density. You can compare it to your other wrist so you know what your unique normal is, and it's a good way to kind of understand where you are on the spectrum of normal. And we published that research on the normal weight bearing in the adult human wrist, so you've got that to compare to. So you do the weight bearing test, and there are certain really important landmarks. First is 45 pounds 
tells you you have a anything over 45 pounds is a functional wrist. Anything below 45 pounds is a non-functional wrist. 65 pounds is a stable, loadable wrist. Anything between 45 and 65, you have a hard time loading it. It affects you when you function normally around the house. Anything below 45 is a severe injury. And in 45 to 65 is a moderate injury. Anything over 65 is a mild injury. And your recovery and treatment changes depending on where you're at. If it's a mild injury, you just have to avoid loading it and you have to wrap it and keep it wrapped and watch it over the course of time for it to get to normal. You can do stretching while you're recovering and you can start strengthening, which is important. We've articulated a strengthening program We've identified muscles that are uh, regularly tight and weak, and it's taken us 15 years to articulate a strengthening program that doesn't make you worse, that actually gets you better. That is an important component to this if you're in a mild, uh, any if you've had a TFCC tear. The moderate people who have 45 to 65 pounds of weight bearing, they're, they have pain with function, so doing dishes, um, lifting children, uh, animals, just any sort of loading hurts it. What you want to do is 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 uh, wrap the wrist with the wrist widget or tape, hold it there and watch it every week and prove, and then change your program accordingly. So if you're at 45, you put the wrist widget on, you're at 50, 55, you wait till it gets to 65. During that time, you avoid any lifting you will avoid any supination with load, which is a lot of tasks. So nothing over five pounds, probably more like two pounds. And you can start a stretching program and a diet program that'll help this heal and get it to that 65 landmark. And then at 65, you can start a strengthening program. The part that gets really hard is in the early um, severe cases, anything under 45 pounds. Anything under 45 pounds is, is, it demands your full attention and a more significant um, follow-up on all kinds of other things. The longer you go with this untreated, the more complicated it gets. So you develop ECU tendonitis, you develop a cascading of events which affect the scaphalunate and the lunotriquetral ligaments and the proximal row of the wrist. So anything over, under 45 pounds really requires special care. No strengthening is, is recommended at all. No wrist extension strengthening, no grip strengthening um, or programs. All of those tend to irritate the wrist. And we've tried a, a variety of different programs to see if strengthening will improve stability. And what we've learned is that it's very difficult and it doesn't really work without huge risks. People who do an early strengthening program with severe tears, they develop all kinds of nerve and uh, tendon problems in the wrist. So you need stability in the wrist first before you go through strengthening. All right, um, I have a question. Do you get a cast after surgery? Well, it depends on the type of surgery. Um, there's a wide variety of different surgical procedures and a wide variety of post-op protocols. I th think that before every surgery, there should be a weight-bearing test done. And your program or your protocol should be determined based on what your pre-op um, uh, weight bearing is. So if it's really low and you're going in for surgery, so let's say you start with 30 pounds of weight bearing and you decide to do surgery because it's not shown any significant progress for a variety of reasons. Um, they, I think those risks need to be protected for a longer period of time after surgery. Um, I think that the casting oftentimes is um, painful and it pushes down on the ulna head. So I think that the protocol should be um, they sh people in this category where they have a severe tear that's gone untreated, untreated for a while. They've developed ECU tendonitis, ulnar nerve problems, a a just a, a kind of a total arm dysfunction they should be um, monitored really closely. So what I recommend is a once every other week follow-up with a hand therapist to make sure that there's not any 
problems that can work, they can work on the elbow mobility and shoulder mobility and kind of keep you out of the woods and guide you as you um, come out of that cast because you're gonna need some help. But in general, um, casting is all over the map. Some people cast um, a past the elbow, some people do a Munster cast, some people do a long forearm cast, some people do a short forearm cast, some people do a removable cast, some people do an over-the-counter splint. It's all over the map. And the person that determines that is the physician and based on what they see. But I think that protocol should change based on your pre-op, um, how long you've had it, how bad it is, and the post-op should be adjusted accordingly. <clears throat> All right, so the next question is what to expect. So if it's a mild tear, it's four weeks. If it's a moderate tear, it's six weeks, six to eight weeks. For a severe tear, it's 12 weeks. And what that means is if you have an acute fall and you blow out the central portion of your TFCC and it's severe and you put the wrist widget on and you're at 30 pounds of weight bearing tolerance where it starts to hurt. And then you put the wrist widget on that takes you up to normal to 80 pounds right away you still have to hold that that's a severe tear that has a, a central tear and it behaves in a really different way than a peripheral tear in, in central complete tears what happens is you put the wrist widget on and the weight bearing goes from 20 to normal right away you still have to hold that those two bones together and give that area time to heal and because it's the central portion it has um, less vascular supply and it takes longer to heal and that's three months. So if you have a severe tear um, and your weight bearing displays a little bit differently, it's a peripheral tear and it goes from 20 to 35 to 42 to 48 or 50, that progress is still going to be a three-month um, plan. So some of the things that can interfere with a normal progression. First is delayed treatment. So you've had it, you've gone unattended for a long time, secondary complications arise, you get scapulunate, lunal triclitoral, ECU tendonitis, extensor carpi ulnaris tendonitis, ulnar nerve symptoms. Those cases are really difficult um, because they involve a lot of different structures and they have an unstable risk, a non-functional risk, those, um, I always, uh, what I'm seeing is people that have this display often have an alongside issue with autoimmunity. So we're seeing things like irritable bowel, indigestion, Crohn's, um, parasitic infect infestations of the gut. We're seeing uh, candida. We're seeing a lot of gut problems associated with this lack of progress and when those are treated they tend to move through the protocol a lot faster so I would encourage anybody that has an under 45 pound weight bearing tolerance and are categorized in the severe category of, of injury take a really good look at your gut and get a stool test and some blood work and make sure your inflammatory markers are there's not something else going on that's contributing to inflammation of the wrist. We see this in rheumatoid arthritis that tends to attack the small bones of the wrist. And so it, it just is a different mechanism. There's a, a different inflammatory process going on in the wrist, which makes healing um, slower. But um, there's uh, it, it still doesn't mean that you you, you don't need support. And if you have a wrist that only has 20 pounds of weight bearing and you put a device on and that device moves you to 40, you've gained 100% of your stability. You're able to do more. And you can watch it over the course of time with the weight bearing test. So, um, or you may need a protective splint so that you're not using your wrist and making things worse. So um, it gets, it, it, it for me, the, the, the tipping point for somebody to go, uh, to make a decision to go through surgery is below 20 pounds of weight bearing, no significant change in weight bearing tolerance, exhaustion of a uh, systemic workup. So you've gone through um, a good blood 
test and stool tests. Make sure you don't have Lyme or uh, parasitic or protozoa or H. pylori or anything else going on that's slowing down the healing. Um, no significant change in your weight bearing over the course of three to four weeks because in those cases, you don't want it to deteriorate any further. And uh, you just they, you just don't want it to get any worse. You don't want it to move to the scapholunate or the lunotriquetral or to the ECU. So those are kind of my general recommendations for um, should you do surgery or not. Okay, there's a difference between central and peripheral. Um, so, you know, the TFCCs is this tiny little two millimeter by four millimeter structure. It's hard. It's the foundation for stability in the wrist. The central portion, we're talking about something this small. The central portion is something down here, and the peripheral portion is here. In the central portions, the symptoms are, both of them have loss of weight-bearing tolerance, but the, the people who have central tears tend to have more pain with end-range supination. People with peripheral tears have more problems with ulnar deviation, and um, so the, they also behave differently. Central tears, they go from zero to 100% really quickly. So you put the wrist widget on no matter where you're at. It goes from abnormal to normal right away. Um, people with peripheral tears, it tends to be more progressive. So it's not just from 20 to 100 pounds. It's 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, little plateau at 50 and then 60. Just, just as the look displays a little bit differently. But uh, uh, the details of a central and per peripheral, there is an overlap and in the mild, the, in, in the mild cases, it's really difficult to distinguish the two. Next question is, what if the MRI shows I have a TFCC, but the weight bearing is unchanged? And we see this a lot. Um, and we're working on a study right now to address this issue. So the, uh, if there is no change in the weight bearing, with tape or the wrist widget, the TFCC is not an issue, even though the MRI says it is. And the, the, what we have found in, in these cases when you look at them closer is there's often an underlying undiagnosed fracture or there's tendonitis. And um, it's really difficult to distinguish a TFCC tear. It's difficult for most people to do that because we do it all the time. And this is all we've been doing for a long time now. Um, we're good at it, but most people have a difficult time distinguishing between a TFCC and an ECU tendonitis or a TFCC and a hamate fracture, unfortunately. Um, so uh, it, it, most practitioners, doctors, hand doctors, um, they just, they're, they have a general view and not a specific view, and so it's difficult to differentiate, and the tools that we have to test it don't help. The lack of the, the consistency and reliability of these tests don't, doesn't help the situation much. So, uh, you know, our mission is to change that, be able to identify TFCC tears early, be able to treat them with objective tools that you can measure change over the course of time and to um, define a treatment program that, that works. Um, so the MRIs are, um, they're, they're, it's not a good uh, tool. Um, it, there's a lot of false negatives as well as false positives. Um, and the, it's, just, it's just not a, a good tool. It's nice, there, it has its purpose, but for, for TFCCs, it's, it tears, it's, it's, it's not great. All right, any other questions? Um, now, if you're somebody that has had, um, yeah, let's see, I don't have any other questions from anybody, um, but I would encourage you to send them. Um, I do these to help the general public understand what a TFCC tear is and how to treat it. Next week, we're going to be going over, we're going to be doing a little something different. We're going to be doing videos on the research. There's really been about only 600 research projects ever written on the TFCC. We have a lot, a lot of research to do. We've got uh, lined up uh, three recent studies we're going to review. Um, and then, of course, we're also going to be enrolling. We're enrolling patients now in a big study that we're running um, and should be getting started here soon on that. What about thumb-sided pain?
<laughs> uh, thumb sided pain is not the TFCC. It's just not. Now, a TFCC tear can develop into radial sided pain, but, but uh, thumb sided pain is a whole nother discussion. And um, yeah, I, that, that, there's a million things that could be gone there. Would you accept people? Mm, Andre, clarify. We do see patients. I do see patients. And um, I, it, yeah, I do accept cases. They're reviewed first. I gather as much information as we can. I try to get MRIs, x-rays, um, any sort of physical therapy notes or occupational therapy notes. And I get weight-bearing numbers and try to get as much information before I accept a case. Um, but yeah, send us, we have a function on our website where you can submit and fill out a form and submit your data that usually triggers Jan to review and contact you. And then he schedules, uh, my time accordingly. Yeah. And we do that. We've been doing that, um, for 16 years. Uh, we have, I, I think data, I'm sure we have the largest collection of data on TFCCs in the world. Um, we've got about 40,000, probably 60,000 cases now of people that have submitted their data and um, reviewed, have been reviewed. So, yes, we do accept cases. Yeah, this is a, yeah, this, I mean, I uh, didn't realize that so many people on the planet had TFCC tears. I just didn't, had no, no, there's really no data on the incidence of this injury. We do know that 100% of cadavers over 65 have deteri objective deterioration of the TFCC. We know that it's now, I know very clearly that it's common. Um, I very clearly that it's common and it's devastating. It's a devastating injury and that's why we, that kind of fuels our work um, because we've, 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 we need to understand this injury a lot better and be able to treat it earlier and um, yeah, we, we've got a lot of work ahead. Come on, any other questions? Um, yeah, I, I usually, I, I am, I, I, I've tried presenting cases online on Instagram, and I think that's hard. Um, I've considered doing, presenting individual cases, um, and that's uh, something I've, I'm considering doing where I take a video and we talk about the details of each case. It's very time consuming to do that. And um, um, we have case studies that we've drafted up and, and uh, we'll probably do more publishing of our case studies, the individual cases. But um, if there's questions that all of you have, send them to us and we'll do a live video on the topic. Um, we've got some things coming up. Um, diet is a super important component. We definitely want to spend a little bit more time on exercise and highlight Jan's work on a wrist ability program. We've got to talk about some um, blood, blood, blood work and stool test results that we've seen um, to correlate those to people that have TFCC tears. Main thing is that um, we keep answering the questions that you all have and uh, keep everybody uh, educated on what they can do and uh, what options are available. Yeah. All right. Um, everybody have a nice weekend and uh, send us your, your thoughts. Don't forget we have that TFCC group on Facebook. It's a large group now. Um, so if you're somebody that wants to talk with other people that have had a TFCC tear or discuss out loud what's going on in your unique case, let us know. Keep track of us on, on YouTube because we're going to be starting discussions on YouTube as well. And let us know if there's anything else we can um, do to make your understanding of the TFCC better. Otherwise, have a nice weekend and aloha to you all. Thank you for joining. Take care.